Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the last speaker of what has been a fabulous day at Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2015. And once again, we have John Cleary. And John is going to talk to us in much greater detail today about SNP markers. And the title of his talk is Surfing the SNP Tsunami, Next Generation Sequencing Testing for the Genealogist. Now, John is a lecturer, teaches at a university in Edinburgh, is a member of ISOL, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, which we should all be members of, and uh, he is involved in a project researching the fate of the Scottish prisoners, as we heard earlier on, uh, but he's also done some incredible work using SNP markers to define uh, the branching pattern within several of his family trees and within the DNA project. And he's also going to give us some very interesting data on how we can use the SNP markers to actually date when that branching pattern occurred. So please give a warm welcome again to John Cleary. So thank you very much indeed, everybody, for coming uh, for the second time to hear me today, those who, if there are any who are sitting through me for the second time. Um, it's a pleasure indeed to be back here to talk to you about this. And I think this talk will be a little bit... Um, uh, slightly more advanced, maybe a bit more intermediate advanced than the one I gave this morning. Um, but can I just ask you, how many of you have um, taken a SNP test of some kind? So quite a few of you, and in general you'd be quite happy if we just talk about SNPs and STRs, haplogroups, I don't need to do definitions of these things. Um, I have a few slides with definitions on, but I think trying to save time I'll just rattle through. Um, so, I mean, it's very... Very quickly, as we're aware, the SNP is a point mutation. So here we have the um, stream of the, um, the, the chain of bases in the, the DNA. Um, and when one of these bases changes to another base, we then have a SNP. A SNP being a single nucleotide polymorphism, polymorphism being a change in the, um, the structure of the DNA. And the, what, what's generally believed about SNPs is that they are uh, permanent. That's not necessarily true, uh, so certainly not in all cases, but they are long-term markers. So once a SNP occurs, it's very unlikely um, to change back again, which means that you will track that SNP through the descendants of the first man who had that, that mutation. Well, SNPs occur all the way across the genome on, on every chromosome. Zone, but I'm focusing today on the, the Y chromosome and therefore again the um, inheritance of the Y chromosome from father to son, which also we believe tracks the uh, the inheritance of the surname from father to son down through the inheritance lines. Now, SNPs tended to be associated with uh, what's called often known as deep ancestry um, because these uh, have been occurring right the way back through human history, right back to the very beginning, which means you can um, identify descent groups uh, which are thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years old. Um, and of course what's interesting today is that as SNP testing becomes uh, more inexpensive, it's becoming within the reach of the genealogist who wants to do more recreational investigation of their genome, and therefore we're finding ways to use these for assisting uh, genealogical research. So, um, a few quick definitions here, which I won't go through because I think you're all familiar with uh, haplogroups and subclades. Um, but essentially, haplogroups are the, the higher level um, groupings marked by letters, where subclades would be any um, group marked by a common marker below that. Um, and all of these, of course, are marked by SNPs. And so, anybody who has a SNP will have inherited that at some stage from an ancestor up through the male line. Um, any time from your father right back to what's known as the Y chromosome, Adam. And um, there are a number of ways of testing SNPs, and this summer we've seen a huge increase in one of those, which is the second one here, the growth in um, panels of SNPs. So pre pre previous to that, there were individual SNP tests, which can still be done at companies like Family Tree DNA and YSeq. And they're very inexpensive. They can be as, as little as $20, as much as $40 per SNP. Um, but the panels of SNPs are now putting together huge collections of these, which are usually related uh, to a particular subclade. So if you wish to investigate whether, or what your subclade is, or whether you belong in a particular subclade, or which subclade of a subclade you belong in, then you can order a panel of, of SNPs for anything from $90 to $120, uh, again from the same two companies, Family Tree DNA and YSeq. Um, 
I'm not going to talk about that today. It's, it's a new development. There's been some new tests released by both companies in the past few months, and they're proving very popular because they are, they are quite cheap. But they're very, very different from the next um, kind of test here, which I am concerned with, which is next-generation sequencing. This being a method to try and read whole sequences of the genome. At the moment, those parts of the genome which have been read by these tests, taken by uh, genealogists, are still rather small. Um, people keep talking in these meetings about a future coming when we'll have our, our entire genome read uh, for a, a relatively small cost. But at the moment we're still talking about um, reading um, stretches of the Y chromosome, and not the whole Y chromosome, just parts of it. But the parts that are read are read in their entirety. So you'll find every mutation, every difference from the reference sequence that you have on those sequences will be read. Um, and this is very different from SNP panels. In the SNP panels, um, investigate SNPs which are known already, which have been found and have been tested previously and put onto the collection. Whereas the next generation sequencing will find whatever is on your, your genome or the part of the genome that's being read. And therefore, it can discover SNPs which are unknown. It can discover SNPs that you may share with lots of people. It may discover one that you had in your generation that even your father wouldn't have. Um, you don't always know, of course, how old or how uh, recent these SNPs are, but it will find all of them on the stretch that's been read. Um, why, why do this? Why test Y SNPs? Well, um, a number of reasons. They can help to identify people who share a recent common ancestor. So, again, as I said, there's a lot of usage of SNP testing for deep ancestry, but increasingly we can apply this to hypotheses we may have about historical ancestors, as um, SNP testing is now beginning to reach the historical period. And there are already some SNPs which can be said to be markers of particularly particular family names and particular branches of families. And that probably is the goal of most people who are involved in this kind of SNP testing, to bring it into the historical era when uh, they can be correlated against known people with known surnames and can then be used as predictors of others who may be part of that family but may have different surnames because they've because of the of, of NPEs and other reasons like that. Um, it's important to say that they are still not very cheap. Uh, relative to other um, DNA tests, but it can be argued they bring great value for money because they bring all the SNPs on the stretch being read, they'll discover new SNPs that are not known, cannot be found by any other method, and they also bring along a package of STRs for those who haven't tested up to the, the maximum level of STRs. So a very common quote is being passed around um, the field at the moment, and I think it was first said by Mike Walsh, though I've got a feeling you would deny that he actually said it, and the idea of SNPs being the trunk and the, the branches of the tree, while the STRs are the leaves on the tree. So in the future, STRs will remain important. Um, SNPs, at the moment, at least from the big Y, don't quite have the discrimination we need to tease apart fine branches of family within the last couple of hundred years. So the, the power that STRs can add to a SNP interpretation will be to work out those fine branches once identified by a SNP that is shared by the branch. So both of these will remain uh, vitally important. Um, here's a couple of examples of um, SNPs which can be shown to be family, uh, identifying SNPs in the sense that all the people so far found with them share a family name. And uh, these graphics are taken from um, Alex Williamson's Big Tree, uh, which I'll say a few words about later on. But here we can see um, a group of McFarlands here, and this is a very well-researched family, a very active surname project. And each of these little blocks here is indicating SNPs um, which identify particular branches of McFarland's. But above here, we see these two SNPs, which appear to be BY674, BY675, which are shared by all of these McFarland's, and so far only by these McFarland's. Um, of course, other people may come along eventually with a different surname, having uh, one of these two SNPs. The chances are they might be a non-parental event, if that's the case. But so far, we can call this is McFarland SNP. Interestingly, they're shared at a higher level, at an older level, this block of um, SNPs here, and these all seem to be identifying members of the black family. So here, here we have another family identifying SNP, which is clearly related to this McFarland SNP, and I suppose people who are um, from the McFarland clan or sept or FEMA will be able to um, tell us 
um, what the relationship may exist between blacks and foreigners. Well, there seems to be something here. But what interests me is that what we have here are um, SNPs identifying families. Um, one more example here is from um, the Maxwell family, and this is from the uh, again taken from the FGC 594 page. Oh, again, of Alex Williamson's big tree, and I'm actually on this page a little bit further along, so I'm very, very distantly related to these Maxwells, very distantly. And uh, what's interesting here is we do have one person who uh, look, looks like a possible um, MPE, but clearly these we can say are Maxwell snips. Um, but here I think we see something which is illustrative of one of the problems with this kind of research. We want to be very gung ho about identifying certain SNPs as family identifiers. We have a great long chain of them here. It actually goes up quite a long way. It's about 20 or, or more SNPs in this block, which have not been divided, shared so far only by the Maxwells and Le Mans. And um, this will go back a long way. This will go back thousands of years um, because it takes that long for all these SNPs to appear, which means we're going back before surnames began. So you have to be careful, I think, in identifying um, certain SNPs too readily as being identifying a particular surname. Um, it's very likely, I would think, that other people eventually will test with other names who will share some of these. I'm sure the Maxwells and Lamang would want that because that will split the block and, put, and bring more structure here. But so far, again, it's re reasonable to say, as things stand now, these look like SNPs identifying the Maxwell family. And there's a chain of six here, which will probably take us back about... Um, 600 years or so at a rough guess. So, um, next generation sequencing then is a, is a method um, for um, compiling the sequence of a stretch of the genome. Essentially, the um, genome is smashed up into bits, which are 100 base pairs long, um, and then these are reassembled by, by clever software into um, uh, mapped against the reference sequence and then assembled into a, a read of the genome sequence for the person being tested. And the, the advantage is it's fast and cheap. Um, and just to enhance this a little bit more, I have um, some stills here from uh, my own um, raw data from my own big Y test, um, in which you can see the reads here. And this is actually showing a SNP here, because this is telling us there is a, a mutation from G in the reference sequence to A in my um, data here. Um, but what, what I want to do here is just pull out slightly to show you the reads. Each of these is a chunk of, um, of my Y chromosome, which is 100 base pairs in length, which has been read and then reassembled. And you see how there are lots of overlapping segments here. That's how the assembly is done. So that um, eventually my, my own genome can be reconstructed. The advantage here being that every read in this position is showing the mutation, so we'd be quite confident that this really is here. And I'll pull out again. You can now see um, all these 100 base pair reads stacking up. You can see certain positions are read uh, a lot, some positions hardly at all, only one read here, um, maybe three or four reads in, in this position here, and of course some stretches are not read at all, and that's the um, think about the big Y test. It's very quite hit or miss in terms of what's being read. You don't get your whole Y chromosome. You don't even get the whole of the so-called readable Y. And some people feel that may be a disadvantage. There's a discussion going on online at the moment about how the uh, another test offered by another company, which covers the whole of the readable Y, is of superior um, quality. And that is probably true, but the advantage of this is the cost is less. So you can make a decision about how much of the uh, Y chromosome do you need to be read to get the kind of data you may need to begin to build structure into your tree. And you don't necessarily need to have the whole thing read, uh, particularly if, if cost is, a, is an issue. So here is a comparison of the two big tests, the, the big Y of family tree DNA and the, uh, the Y elite test of the full genomes. Um, corporation. Um, this is drawing upon data published in the ISOG wiki, um, a very useful source of information. Um, and very recently, um, the Full Genomes Corporation have introduced a new variant of the test with longer read length. So they're reading longer chunks of the, the DNA. Um, one would think that would lead to uh, more reliability in the decision. I don't know enough about the technology here to know exactly what difference it makes. But I suppose it is a, a question that can be asked now since the big Y test is itself about two years old. Um, I wonder if there are any similar moves on this side to begin to match the, the read lengths 
of the Full Genome Corporation. But a key figure down here is the amount of the, the readable Y chromosome that's read. Y elite aims to get about 90% of it, and uh, the big Y aims to get about 55%. You might think that's um, a huge drop in this. And though without doubt, there probably are key SNPs that are of interest to some researchers that are being missed by the big Y. I mean, in fact, the one I mentioned earlier called FGC5494, which is a, a very important branch marker, is not read by the big Y at all. Now, I, I have that marker, but it's not read in my big Y test, so I had to test elsewhere to find out whether or not I was positive for that marker. Now, I don't regard this as a problem, because I think that when gene gen genetic genealogists want to conduct the kind of research project I was talking about this morning, cost matters, and how you distribute the money you may have towards test also matters. And my, my own view is the big Y is giving us enough to go on to make it worthwhile thinking about doing two big Y tests on two people who may be related rather than a single uh, full genome test on just one person for sort of similar amounts of money. But other people may have different views about that. Um, the, the Y chromosome is divided into um, a number of different regions, um, some of which are more likely to furnish useful SNPs than others. And the big Y test family tree DNA say is designed to target those regions which are more useful in providing SNPs for family, family research. It doesn't mean they get them all, but the, the test is designed to target regions that have a lot of known SNPs that have been discovered beforehand and where it can be assumed because of the greater density of known SNPs there may be greater density of uh, new SNPs and possibly greater density of reliable new SNPs as well. So a little diagram here um, of the regions of the white chromosome, just to give you some idea of what we're talking about here. Um, it's drawn a classic article of Skeletsky and Null, um, who first mapped the regions of the, the white chromosome. And straight, straight away you see that about half of the white chromosome can't be read at all because it is too repetitive and hasn't been mapped. And therefore, uh, when we talk about the readable Y chromosome, we're not talking about this or this part here, the centromere, or the two tips, um, which recombine with the X chromosome. So these white areas here would be your readable Y chromosome. And these also divide into uh, a number of regions, known as the pseudo-autosomal um, section. Um, actually, that, that's the, the tip at the end, it recombines. Um, and there we are, that's the repetitive area. And here then are the regions of the, the readable Y, again colour-coded here, into the X-degenerate section, the yellow, the apiconic section, or region, and the X-transposed regions. And let's see if you do better than the people in Birmingham. Uh, I want to put the same question to them in the spring. Uh, which of these regions do you think might be the one most targeted or better target for um, Y SNPs? Come on, <laughs> go on, tell us, Morris. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, I'm sure many know the answer, and it is in fact the ectogenerate region. Um, and again, to simplify things greatly, this would once have been similar to the X chromosome, it doesn't recombine with the X chromosome, and it accumulates mutations over the millennia, and therefore it is degenerated away from the state it would have shared with the X chromosome, and therefore that is where you'll find those mutations, the SNPs that we're interested in. The X transposed a region is um, quite, similar, quite similar to the X chromosome. It's therefore very difficult to be certain if you find a SNP on this stretch that it is actually on the Y chromosome and not on the X. Um, and the amplaconic regions um, contain some of the repetitive areas known as palindromes, um, which actually have a lot of good SNPs and contain most of the genetic um, information on the, the Y chromosome. But they, um, because the palindromes have this habit of overwriting each other, it means that SNPs you may find on, on one of the palindromes could disappear if they're overwritten by another stretch that didn't have that SNP, and therefore these SNPs are not reliable in the sense that they may not track a family uh, line all the way down in all cases, and you may therefore get false negatives, or actually true negatives, but because the SNP has been lost through this process. So therefore the tendency um, from um, organisations like Wifle.com, who analyse uh, raw data for um, testers, is to focus on SNPs in this area, uh, on the grounds they tend to be more reliable and more likely to persist down the generations and therefore be reliable markers of those family branches you're trying to find. There we are.
So, how do we go about um, dealing with this data? I think those of you, and, and how many of you have done the big Y test? Amongst you, so quite a few of you. And perhaps you were, I don't know if you were daunted initially by the way in which results reported to you. Um, but there's a, a lot of data to deal with, and when it comes from family tree DNA, it's not necessarily presented in a way that's very easy to digest. And uh, we do need help. Um, I think it's um, one of these things we need to go to people who have an expert view. And, and such people include haplogroup project administrators, who probably are the leading experts on their particular haplogroup and the SNPs within it, um, but also um, many skilled enthusiasts who developed um, software, who developed um, processes for analysing the raw data files and pulling out the information that is of interest to the, the tester. Um, and there's not something that's, that is easy to do yourself, but actually you can also do it yourself and I'll look at how that can be done uh, later. Um, so, I think that um, if, if STR testing lent itself to the growth of spreadsheets and big cross tables comparing lots of numbers with each other, I think SNP testing is leading us back towards something very familiar to the genealogist, which is the tree diagram. And um, again, there are, there are many um, different varieties of trees being designed um, by people involved in projects. And I think Morris is going to tell us tomorrow about um, trees and, and their uses in, uh, in, uh, in gen 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 genealogy. Um, but this is one of, the, um, one of my favourite trees um, that's been de designed by a man called Alex Williamson, who's put together what he calls the big tree. And um, Gene was talking earlier about the, the P312 marker of one of the key uh, markers in Western Europe. So Alex is working on the, the P312 marker and his descendants. And this is the top of his tree, um, in which we can see the, the key next level markers, including L21, which will of course be uh, one of the most common markers in Ireland, um, and other markers along here. And he is building a descent tree of every person who takes um, a next generation sequencing test and who submits his raw data to Alex. So what we're seeing essentially is something like an embryo tree, great tree, of, um, of, of the Y chromosome, potentially. Um, just give on to the next page. This is the FGC 5494 page. Now, one of the things you've got to grapple with when you come into the world of SNP testing are these awful names. Uh, every single one of them is named with some utterly unmemorable combination of letters and numbers. Uh, and in the end, what most people do is remember their own, and the ones that are of immediate relevance to them, and the top-level ones, but forget the rest. And I think the best thing we can say is just, just view them like um, catalog numbers, uh, means of looking up in, in a list or, in, or an index to find out what particular um, SNP it is, where it is located, and so on. Um, so here we have the one that marks the haplogroup that I'm in. There's a haplogroup underneath um, L21. Um, it didn't feature in the, the Munster Irish talk yesterday, even though I, my, my family is from Munster, though they may not have come from Munster before then, we, we don't know. Um, as you see, um, along the bottom here are all the people who tested positive for some line of this, and you'll see the flags will tell us where they're from. There's quite a few Irish flags here, actually. Um, quite a few English ones over here. Um, some around here should be the Maxwell, here, here are the Maxwells again, some English flags. And uh, round about here is some fellow called Cleary, Martin Red. And uh, Martin Red, because um, a very nice um, function that Alex Williamson has designed recently is to overlay um, STR data on top of this tree uh, by color coding particular markers. So I've picked out one here that uh, is a very rare marker that I have. And so I'm the only person around here who has this. I share this with. My, my Gorman genetic relatives who have not tested Big Y yet. Um, and over here we've got someone called uh, Mr. Brunet, who also has the same marker, but we, can't, we haven't got a common origin for this. This is two separate occurrences of, of this STR appearing because all the people in between us do not have it. Um, so anyway, down here then we have the colour coding and we can see what the normal um, reading is, which is a value of 13 for this particular marker, and a few people here have got uh, 14, I think, and then two of them have um, 11. So again, this is a very nice way in which we're seeing with a tree being developed to um, capture the um, SNP data. And I think this is, um, in some ways, more intuitively, I think, easier to read than the big cross tables you find with STR data, in the sense that once you find out what line you're tracking, you can track it right the way down. 
And uh, Alex Williamson is also adding, once you get the, the person at the bottom, whoops, pushing too hard, you get um, personal data about their private SNPs. So on the tree here, you see all these SNPs that I share with one other um, test. That's not a big Y test, unfortunately. Um, this is someone who is probably no longer alive and was part of the, the 1000 Genomes Project. And I do not know anything about him, apart from the fact that he is from Barbados. Um, but we clearly share a very deep ancestry from thousands of years ago. And these are the SNPs we share with each other. And then when you click on my name, you get all the SNPs Alex Williamson has found in my raw data, which are private only to me. Now, uh, they're only private to me because nobody else close related to me has tested yet. Um, if, if someone were to test who's closely related to me, then many of these were found to be shared, and that will introduce a bit more complexity into the big tree. But I, I think the big tree is tremendous because uh, what SNP testing is opening up is the possibility of this tree um, eventually being extended all the way back. I mean, this could ultimately be the great tree of, um, of the Y chromosome descent. And a similar tree could, of course, be constructed for uh, mtDNA. So um, this ultimately could capture everybody. Um, I don't know if um, um, computer, modern computing has the processing power to do that, but certainly um, um, within P312, the huge P312 subclade, um, this is capturing anybody who will do an NGS test. And at least anybody who does that test will be able to see where they're located in relation to all other testers. And as you see, there's a big difference between here where again, like me, there's probably no one close related who's tested, and here, where people have tested several people, and they're getting um, SNPs here into the historical period. So, um, how do you go about um, analyzing your, your raw data? Well, I think it's definitely well worth sending your raw data, known as a BAM file, if you do the big Y test, to um, one of the um, analyst companies who will do a third party analysis of your data for you. They'll pull out the SNPs they find, they will um, um, give you a full report on, uh, on those SNPs and on the quality of those SNPs, and they'll also give you um, a large pile of STRs, which will include something like 96 um, to 100 or so of the 111 panel offered by Family Tree DNA. Now, I, I had about 101 of those 111 STRs in my test. Um, and I'd done the 111 test already, so I was able to compare the two side by side, and they were all absolutely accurate. So every single one agreed with the Family Tree DNA test that I'd previously done. Um, I think we're not yet at, this, at the stage where we'll have a single test for just SNPs and STRs, but it seems to me the potential is there, and I think this, this must be coming at some stage. Um, of course, it's still very useful for project administrators to see the STR tests done by the uh, potential big white testers before they do it, because those STRs will give guidance as to where um, people may be related. Um, so there are two companies doing the uh, third-party analysis, including the Full Genomes Corp, who, of course, do NGS tests and will supply a full report on the tests they do, but will also analyse the BAM files from family tree um, DNA tests. And a good example here of how you can use the, the YFUL um, graphical interface as a BAM file reader. I think it's important that genealogists should have access to their raw data and a means to read the, the raw data file they have. And so YFUL make it possible by allowing you to browse your own uh, test position by position, seeing what results you have there. Um, this one is showing a uh, SNP, which is called YP355. And this was discovered about 18 months ago, and we now know it's a, a major SNP in the uh, so-called Young Scandinavian subclade. I'll say a few words about that later on. Um, and it also tells us that we have a good quality SNP here as well. So, let's get through this quickly. If you're a, a tester, 
you can actually do a lot of the, of the analysis yourself. And with um, a colleague in the Cummings surname project, Tim Cummings, we've developed our own approach to taking the family tree DNA list of results and uh, filtering out um, the chaff and finding the wheat um, that's useful to the people who are taking tests. Um, so if you get your results from family tree DNA, you get something like this, um, which you'll see a long list of position numbers and the particular mutation you have, um, and family tree DNA's own assessment of the quality. It's a very rough and ready assessment of quality, however. Um, and there are other ways of finding uh, raw data of people who match you. Um, so, for example, if, if someone matches um, your test, so that these are matches to uh, someone by the name of Kemp, who's in the Kemp project I, I run, um, we can find out again what their results are, um, by looking at, first of all, which ones they share with the person who matches. So these are matching to the Kemp snips. They both share these. And then which ones are, are unique um, to the, the tester, which are not shared with the, uh, the Kemp tester. So this way, you can put together a list of the uh, FTDNA's um, unique positions from the big Y test. And then you go through a filtering process. So this is a spreadsheet we designed which filters out the, the SNPs giving us, first of all, any SNP that's already been identified as being shared with other people. And these here are all subclade defining. They're all actually in the YP355 subclade which we're investigating. And these ones then are these SNPs which in this particular test are all positive up to here. So this person has all of these upwards, but then doesn't have these. And in this case, it's rather curious, we think, that they don't have these ones. So these ones here are SNPs we want to investigate further and find out why this person doesn't appear to be positive for them. And you can also filter out the SNPs which are known to be not reliable. So various reasons, whether they're palindromic or in repetitive areas, or simply found to repeat many times in many haplogroups, um, we can get rid of these. And these are all listed as family tree DNA uh, hits, if you like. Uh, most people find they've got around about 130 to 140 novel variants, as they're called. But what you want to do is get that list down to about 10 to 20, which will be the generally good quality ones. So the vast majority of these you'll throw out because they've been found and are known to be not particularly useful. Um, so once you've done that, you can then do a, a consistency check on the ones you've found. This is where uh, YFUL, again, we're using to uh, further our research very useful. We have a, a very handy function called the group browser. So anybody who shares a particular haplogroup here, R1A, can join this. And you can then search any position and find out whether the tests are positive or negative for it. Here's YP355 again. A very nice clear read, a very clear grouping here who are all positive. That's a subclade. And all the ones who don't have it who are not in that subclade, so nice clear read there. But you may get a read a bit like this, in which um, you find it's a bit inconsistent, lots of unclear reads, therefore this particular position is, is not going to be a high quality SNP for, for whatever particular reason. Um, and we can see here that there is, um, that this shows that the, even the read for individual testers is uncertain, so we would just reject this one and uh, wouldn't take it any further. So what we're doing is, is winnowing down uh, the list of variants of those which seem to be reliable and consistent. It's not to say that some of these are the ones are not, totally, are not going to be useful at some stage in the future, but at this stage they're inconsistent and are not going to help um, develop clear um, branching trees like the one we saw earlier. Um, so very quickly then, a um, little case study here of how I came to do this. Um, I work on the Kemp project, and I have relatives whose name is Kemp, and we found that a lot of other surnames closely match them, and we began to investigate these surnames as well, and we labelled this group the Jacks, which stands for Jacobs, Anderson, Cummings, Kemp, and Small, um, and all of these families, with the exception of Jacobs, seem to have some association with the northern part of Ireland. So there seems to be a grouping um, with connection with Ireland, no obvious connection with Scotland, despite the fact these may look like plantation names. We haven't found that at all. The Jacobs don't know where they come from. Um, they're all descended from one migrant to the USA uh, from the 17th century. They don't know where he came from, and they'd like to. Um, so we found that this, this group has some distinctive STR markers, and 
We also ran them through a few utilities like the McGee utility here um, and got some evidence of uh, looking like connection here and uh, through clustering uh, network diagrams like Philip here. And again, if you look at this one here, we've got other R1A down here. We've got the Scottish um, so McDonald's uh, family up here, which are not too far away from us. They're also within the L448 subclade. And here then are the Kemp's, Jacob's and Cummings. Rather jumbled together, but there's a, a Jacob's branch. Um, here is a Kemp branch. They look like they're fairly well-defined family branches. And the Cummings seem to be a bit more all, all over the place. So to cut a long story short then, we began to expand this into a much wider analysis of the whole subclade of YP355. And um, a year ago, I presented, not this, but this diagram to, to, to GGI 2014, which was an embryo of what's now turned into this. And so we have a lot more structure in the tree. We have about 31 big Y tests, plus a number of um, single SNP tests and uh, some panel, SNP panel tests, which we've been using to identify these um, branches. And all the um, labels showing here are all um, shared SNPs that are held by at least two people or more. They've all got names because Wifel very kindly named them for us, but I don't think having names is particularly important. And what's important is finding whether something is shared by two or more people and therefore must represent a pre-branching stage of that family line. So underneath each of these blocks we find branches. And here is the, the Kemp and Cummings over here. And we have an estimate of dates. So I'm not actually going to go too much into dating because it's very complicated and um, I think it's um, unclear as well. So we have a very, very rough estimates of what the dating of these splits may be. And we imagine from those diagrams I showed you earlier that Kemp, Cummings, etc., probably shared an origin round about the Dark Ages. So it's slightly pre-surname, but um, only just pre-surname. In fact, the number of SNPs we find since branching, so the Kemp's here, here are Cummings and one or two other surnames, suggest the, 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 the branch may be more like the 8th century. Um, I'm not drawing any significance of that particular date. I think it simply means that's when the, the, two, the, the common ancestor last lived, and since then the two families have diverged. Um, while still being found in similar parts of Northern Ireland, Tyrone, Fermanagh, and Cavan. Um, and here we have what we might call genealogical time, very, again, very, very roughly, just a little bit after um, 1300 here. And of course, as I said earlier, that, that varies a lot depending whether you're in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. Um, but some of these snips, again, are just peeping, scraping into genealogical time. But I'm not ready yet to do as the Maxwells and the McFarlands have done, um, declaring any of these to be uh, family predictive snips. Because you see, these are blocks, and of course we don't know which of these is the oldest and which is the youngest, which is nearest to the branch and which is much older. So any of these could be pre-surname, and one, one or two of them could be post-surname, we just don't know which one. So we're, we're dependent really on a lot more testing being done, which would probably take uh, a few years to get even more structure into this. But I think the extent to which this tree has grown in just 12 months is quite uh, earth-shattering, actually. There are still more big Y tests in the pipeline, which will add even more to this. So I'm going to um, finish by talking about some of the pitfalls. And Morris announced earlier today he was going to talk about uh, convergence. I thought, oops, I'll make a few, a few more slides then. And um, though I think it's an interesting question, again, to what extent STRs and SNPs can relate to each other, since many of you are probably very familiar with STR and testing, you may be moving into SNP testing as an adjunct to it. Um, so taking a little chunk here off the, the tree I showed you, uh, with the Kemps and Cummings here, um, we identified this STR marker, uh, a rare marker within R1A, um, as being um, the, the marker for this JAX group. So in other words, it's found in this line and this line, so it must have originated somewhere in here, which suggests it's actually a very old and very stable marker, um, going back possibly to the 8th century, if we're drawing correct conclusions about how old these, that this, this branch branching split is. Um, little mistake here, this should be YP618, by the way, there it is. This is the overall subclade here, which is below YP355. Um, and then, just after GGI last year, um, another result appeared in a Norwegian person, also containing uh, DYS44721. And we thought, ooh, 
it must be even older than we thought. Now, many of these branches in this um, tree have a mixture of isles and Norwegian names. So clearly, most of these higher-level SNPs seem to be appearing in Scandinavia and then dispersing by, by whatever routes uh, across Europe. Um, but we thought the, the Kemp Cummings one hadn't any Norwegian names and therefore post-dated the move of these, uh, probably of this block here, into the Isles. Um, and suddenly we found we had a Norwegian in this, in this group as well, so we thought maybe the Jacks need to be renamed the Jackos, or, or maybe the Ojacks. Anyway, um, since the, the Norwegian is called Olsen, by the way, hence the O. Um, however, this summer, the, this, the Norwegian tested um, a single SNP and found himself to be YP618 minus. In other words, he's not in this subclade. So once again, it's a trap I mentioned this morning. We, fall, we fell into it once again here in putting too much credibility on a single STR as being more predictive than it actually is. I think it is very predictive, actually. It does seem to be very stable. We haven't found anybody um, in this group who has had a, a, a mutation away from that. But clearly, this must be another occurrence uh, of this. But it, I think what's interesting to me is a sense to which First of all, there seems to be a bit of convergence here between these two markers, but also that the SNPs are now exploding this. We can make a hypothesis about how this Norwegian related to the JAX group and SNP testing has blown that open and shown actually um, not where the, the Norwegian person fits in the tree, but where he doesn't fit on the tree. Um, a second example of this, and I'll finish after this, is um, in another branch of the same tree, and... Um, here is um, a grouping put together by the R1A project, which they're predicting of these four people, who have all now, uh, three of them have done the big Y, and one has done uh, a lot of individual SNP testing, form one single subgrouping under this newly discovered SNP in this tree, um, YP1426. And they put this together on the basis that there's a shared STR. It's not the only shared STR, there are a couple of shared STRs here, which make up the signature here, in which most of them have um, 16. One here, who's actually a McPherson, um, or descended from McPherson's of Sutherland, uh, has 18, and the norm for the overall subclad seems to be 17. So the r project concluded reasonably that you have a branch market here moving in one direction, uh, and they would all th therefore be close to each other, and McPherson would be further away in his own um, sub-branch. However, it's not quite how that worked out. This is how we constructed the tree originally. And here we have a block, which is two SNPs together. And again, one of the goals of this kind of research is to split the blocks so eventually we get one SNP at each branching point. It's going to be impossible to do for everything because many of the peop other people who um, have some of these SNPs but not all will have died out. Those lines won't exist anymore. We'll never split every single SNP block. But this one has been split. And very interestingly, it didn't split along the lines predicted by the RNA project. Instead, what we found was, first of all, um, a man by the name of Mr. Tolchard, who is um, a member of the, the Devon project, um, found that he was negative uh, for this particular SNP, which we thought he would have. It was a no-call in his big Y test. In other words, there was no result there. And then looking at his BAM file, we found he was actually positive for this particular SNP. Therefore, we, we had to move him out of this, this STR16 group, um, and he's now further away from them than the McPherson with the other STR result. But one more revision yesterday. I had an email from someone who's taken uh, a, a single SNP test for YP1461, um, suspecting believing he was here, but suspecting he might be like Mr. Tolchard, and indeed we found he actually is. So, in other words, we now have these two here in a para group under this group. We don't know if they share any more SNPs in common yet. Uh, and we have these two here remaining under this level, and the McPherson now sits in between them in this level, closer to these two than to these two. Um, this may all seem a little bit like train spotting to an extent, but I think what's very interesting for people in this group is it has exploded again a hypothesis based on STR testing. And it's shown how the, this tree must be structured and means that this particular STR um, is not going to be a very good predictor of how people may fit within these groupings. Instead, the SNPs are showing us how the groupings are actually structured of course, there will still be a role for those STR results that they have in working out the finer, um, more recent branching lower down the tree. So I'm going to stop at this stage, um, 
and um, throw the floor open for some questions given late in the day, and I'm sure many of you are looking forward to your dinner. But if you have any questions I can, I can answer about SNP testing, please do ask away. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for another very interesting talk. Uh, I, I know it has been mentioned several times during a number of presentations today and the like, you know, the different technologies, STR, NGS testing and uh, SNP testing and the like. Certainly for people who have multi-genetic names or people whose history has sort of resulted in a whole series of people with different surnames having almost historical SNPs. That makes life very complicated in terms of trying to work out a, a testing strategy because the cost of these tests and what you get back for them are, very, are, are quite considerably different. I mean, the single SNP, if you think that somebody is on your, you can get a single SNP result for $20, as you say, but clearly it will be advantageous to the wider community and other branches if you could persuade either yourself or your other half uh, or the, the testee to pay for a big Y or a, a Y full test but that's very very difficult because that's you know quite a lot more yeah yeah, yeah. no I think that there's, no, there's no question there's a, a cost issue here and uh, I, I think it, the ideal situation really is because you don't need to test everybody in a branch by big Y two or three would be enough depending on the degree of variation within that, um, that, that, that cluster from the STRs. So I think you could club together and if, every, if everybody in a group of 10 chips in $10, then, uh, sorry, not 10, but $50, then you'd be able to cover a big Y, $10 optimistic. Um, but I think people don't tend to do that. So I think most big Ys are funded by people who are paying for themselves and they are contributing a huge basis of knowledge. I mean, the, the, the SNP panel tests, which now are much more cost um, a low cost option for people to test their SNPs are, are based on the research from the big Y. Without the big Y, these SNP panels would not be possible. But of course, it has to be borne in mind that what you don't get from the SNP panel tests is discovery of anything new. You're only testing whether or not you may have particular SNPs which are known. Now, I think once a branch has investigated its structure, and I think in my, my Kemp branch, um, I'm not convinced that any more big Y testing will be advantageous. We've done two, and they're so close to each other that it's, I find it hard to imagine there'll be a lot of variation uh, from the others. So I think we probably have enough there. Um, I'd like to see more elsewhere, but I think with those two in that family cluster, um, STRs will now be much more useful. But of course, if others wanted to know whether um, they were part of a particular subclade, of that subclade, they can take the panel test to do that. Um, in my Spirin project, what we did was we pooled uh, we, uh, money together and we actually tested the two members of the project, we only got 12 members in the project, tested the two members that seemed the most genetically distant from each other. And that actually, the common ancestor was probably 1600, or sometime in the 1600s, but it turned up a difference of two SNPs between two the, the two project members. Yeah. So it actually proved to be a very, very useful um, exercise. And I think I would encourage anybody that's running a certain project to set up a general fund, advertise it on yeah. your Facebook page or a partner activity feed, and just get that money together for the two most distant members of your project. Yeah. A question from James Irvine. Uh, John, that was, I'm going to have to move away from the microphone. Yeah. That was just terrific. Um, I heard you talk uh, a few months ago, and the progress you've made is, is admirable. Unfortunately, tomorrow I'm going to start torpedoing some of it. That's fine. Um, but, uh, I look forward to it. <laughs> but this, this will be illustrative of just the difficulties we all face. One specific one I'd like to take up this evening, but I won't take up tomorrow. You said that you, you, you looked at your own um, uh, big wide tests for SDRs and the 111 markers find 100% uh, agreement between them, between the uh, SDRs and the, from big Y and from, um, mm. from the original SDR data. I find a very different answer. I got I have five five um, uh, comparisons I've made, mm -hmm. some sixty seven, some one hundred and eleven, yeah. and find only about ninety percent correlation okay. and mm -hmm. some significant omissions. And I've got the impression that, that I would much rather trust for SDRs yeah. the original SDR tests mm -hmm. and, and not touch the big Y version of 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's quite dangerous. Same, same I, think, I think it's far too early to say that the big Y can substitute or replace big Y tests. Um, it just so happened in, in, my, in my case, I had 101 or 111 panel, and they were all the same as the FTDNA reads, but maybe we need more investigation of this to see how consistent that is. Yeah. We have a question from Debbie. It wasn't a question, it's just a comment. Um, Family Tree DNA no longer um, give you the data for the STRs and the test. Are you sure about that? Yeah. They, they, they're taking the, the MT-DNA out. Are you sure they're taking the STRs oh, out? Oh, yeah. the yeah. MT-DNA, yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. No, I, th I think it is, there's a lot of debate about this earlier in the year when Family Tree DNA stopped providing the MT-DNA data that was included incidentally in the big Y. Now, I also found, I, I actually have done the full genome, um, the, the full mitochondrial sequence, and again, I found that my MT-DNA results in the big Y were 100%, and they're all exactly the same as my FMS, but many people only get 80 or 70% or, or less, so there's a lot of variability in those MT-DNA results that were being reported before the spring. And the big why isn't, isn't about mtDNA, so I don't think it matters really that it's been taken out. But I think the STRs can't go because they're part of the sequencing. There are the SNPs in, inside STRs which we need to know about, and of course the STRs themselves form part of the sequence of your DNA. So to strip them out would be removing part of the raw data the customer actually is entitled to. And that, that would worry me if, if mtDNA tried to do that. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. It's one thing, actually, the read lengths, if we, if um, FTDNA do improve the read lengths, it will be the STRs that will improve. Yes. Um, so if we can get the 250 data to read lengths, which I hope we will do that. Yes. I hope so soon, yes. When is the cost going to fall, John? Oh. Your crystal ball? Uh, but, but rather then. <laughs> I mean, the. The, the, there are sales every year. I think most people who've ordered bit, the big Y have probably done it on a sale. There's one happening right now, which Morris has helped to organise, and I'm sure there's one in Christmas, at the Christmas time as well, yeah, as it usually is. Off the big Y at the show, which brings it down from $575 to a mere $475. <laughs> so, uh, a sniff. I'm a waiting sniff. for the day when it actually comes down to $100. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks for the talk. Thank um, you. Just to come back to Yes, I think I think I think Jim's going to answer here as well. But actually, I think not especially accessible. But I think what you have, um, if you've done the FTDNA Big Y test, is you have a list of novel variants, and you can work from that. Um, if you have the right kind of filtering, the right reference materials to see which um, of these variants are known to be uh, unstable, which have been discovered already, labelled, identified as, as being not reliable, you can filter those out. So, It's, it's, it's not full data. Absolutely, it's not. It's not full data. The spreadsheet. But again, what I would say, to, but what I do recommend to anybody I know who does a big Y is to pay the extra forty or fifty dollars to get the third-party analysis. So you can send your your, your uh, BAM file um, to uh, one or two the, the two companies I mentioned earlier who will do the full analysis for you. But what I'm suggesting also was that that it's not an, an insuperable barrier for the organ genealogist to take on um, seeing what they can work out themselves from their own results. And um, you, you, you can also view your own BAM file if you wish, and there are some quite good graphical readers. But with a little bit of training, you can actually begin to see the patterns yourself in your own, own data. I think Jim will speak. BAM file reader is available, so you can see, send yeah. your big wide BAM file, or you can put the, the BAM file into one of these readers, and mm -hmm. uh, you can read it that way. And James is going to comment on it as well. <laughs> I'm going to attempt to show you how to do it tomorrow. Actually, <laughs> DIY. Yeah. Can I say, we're not doing the kind of analysis we, we, which you'll which you be doing. Um, essentially what we're doing is filtering out a list that's already been prepared for us and working out what's useful and what's not useful in that list. Yeah, sure. um, yeah so it's been fantastic again, I've learned a lot. But you, I wanted to ask about one thing that you said was difficult just because I think it's important, and that's the estimating the dates ah. of origin. Um, because, you know, in order to collaborate with historians and genealogists, it seems like we really need to get accurate dates for those now that we're in the historical time frame. So 
you mentioned, you know, 100 years per common SIP. Is there anybody doing, making any advances on getting that more accurate? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, there have been two important papers published in the past year uh, attempting to um, date um, SNP branches. Uh, one was published by the, the Weifel team and was based on their own method, which was, which was around correlating um, the age of the um, um, Malta boy uh, remains in, in Siberia, uh, which have been carbon-14 dated, and then by counting the SNPs, which they've uh, derived from his DNA, they then come up with their own calibration for what the mutation rate may be. The other paper was produced by the, the Icelandic team at DECODE, um, who are basing their own calibrations on pedigrees. As, as you may know, Iceland has got excellent, excellent uh, records, historical records, and um, there's a huge, a huge genealogical database containing a very large proportion of the Icelandic people, and there's been a very wide collection of DNA there as well. And so DECODE have been using the Icelandic data database, again, as a means of correlating the, the age of the SNPs they've identified in, in their research. And the, the two papers have come up with slightly different mutation rates, but not greatly different mutation rates. And so, as a, very, as a rough rule of thumb, um, from that, people are now talking about roughly 150 or 160 years per SNP from the big Y. Obviously, it depends which test you take, how much of your Y chromosome is in red, but Y full of defined, a defined region of the, of the Y chromosome, they call the, the combat area, and their, their 155 approximately year mutation rate is based on that. So you can count the SNPs in each branch if you wish. You can average how many SNPs per branch there may be in, say, this branch or this branch, and then multiply that by the, um, by the number of years per SNP. But obviously, we've got very few samples here, so we're averaging a very low number of samples, and therefore any numbers we derive for more recent SNPs uh, are not going to be greatly reliable. It has to be a huge margin of error around them. Um, it's probably more reliable for the much older SNPs. We, uh, a total example of this is probably about 3,000 years old. And these, are, these two children SNPs here are probably not much younger. They're, they're maybe around uh, 2,000 years old at most than the rest. You have to be careful because you can, you can try to estimate what the ages may be, but with very few samples, we're not going to get very, very reliable figures. But we can, that, that's where the numbers yeah. down the side come from, essentially. Again, I'm going to yeah. try and explain this tomorrow how you actually do it. Good, yeah. Not, not, not repeat the basic research, but the actual mechanics of how you do it. Yeah, good, yeah. Okay, it's quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's easy, <laughs> but it's, been, it's reliable. It's very <laughs> Yes. Uh, that's it. Method is easy. The answer is confusing. <laughs> um, quick question from Jerry. I, I found fresh disease about 130 years mm -hmm. lower. Yes. Um, in, in, in order of fractions, my, my fractions were for uh, um, analyzing this stuff. Uh, Alex Williams' big trick. Yes. The easiest to clear us. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, white fold. Yes. To get the dates. Um, we also uh, integrate all the ancient DNA. Yes. As many samples. Yes. Very useful and thoroughly um, accurate. Yes. Uh, I have a quick question. You you mentioned your closest match of the um, the big tree was from Barbados. Yes. Did you consider that it's one of the leftovers from Falkirk or from you know worship to Barbados? Have you considered that? I, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's some connection there. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of you know there's a lot of Irish Y-DNA in Barbados for historical reasons, for the actions of Cromwell, and, uh, and I think the, the restoration regime as well were as guilty. And um, it could be a... I don't, I don't know where my ancestors come from. I'm assuming that they are Irish, they could be Scottish or Welsh. Uh, when you go back to these kind of time depths. So, but yes, I think the, the Barbadian is probably descended from people who were Barbadoed from either Scotland or Ireland, yeah, indeed. But just on the other point I made, Jared, um, I, I, I agree with your analysis of, of Alex Williamson and Wifel, but I would say to um, people who've done the big Y, send your raw data to as many places as possible and get as many um, analyses as you can. He's shaking his head, but I would say do it, because the differences can be instructive and illuminating. So I sent mine to both uh, Alex Williamson and Wifel, and there were slightly different analyses from both, which, I, again, I can use in my research. So, yeah. We agree on that. I've done the same <laughs> with the yeah. Gleason uh, mm. DNA project, which I'll be talking about tomorrow. Again, looking at it from a, a slightly different perspective, I want to try and reconstruct the branching pattern within my Gleason family tree. Of the 13 members in the project, six of them have done the big Y test, and so that's almost 50% of people mm. in the Gleason.
recently, and they probably could have done with the big wide test. Two of them are actually brothers, and they have different snips compared to each other. Mm, interesting. So this is cutting edge science, John. Mm -hmm. And between yourself and James, it is so wonderful to have you both here at the conference yeah. because you're bringing to us the latest discoveries that will change the way that we think about reconstructing our family trees. So I just want to give you a very, very big thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.